It's great to be here. It really is. Uh, you're one of my favorite shows, and I always enjoy being on with you guys. Excellent. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, you know, why don't we do like this for potential new listeners, for those who might be new to this subject, have never heard about the Starchild skull. Give us a quick rundown uh, of, of this uh, issue, Lloyd, and how you got into this. Okay. Well, it, the star child skull is a real, true bone skull. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it was found in Mexico in about 1930 by a woman who thought it was just a, a misshapen human of some kind, a, a birth defect, a deformity, and she kept it and another skull that she found in a mine tunnel for the duration of her life from about 1930 to the early 90s. And when she found out that she was dying, she passed them on to some friends of hers. They kept them for about five years and passed them on to some friends of theirs. This all occurred in El Paso, Texas in the States, although she found the skulls in Mexico, about 100 miles southeast of Chihuahua. So when the skulls came into the possession of Ray and Melanie Young, Melanie had been a neonatal nurse for a number of years, and she knew an awful lot about human deformity. And right away, she knew this was very different than your typical standard human deformity. It was entirely too light, it was entirely too symmetrical, and its physical properties were so different from a normal human, she right away suspected that it wasn't entirely human. More importantly, she and her husband, Ray, were members of MUFON in El Paso, which is the Mutual UFO Network. In other words, they were interested in UFO things, and so they could both see that the star child skull looked as if it would fit perfectly inside the head of a gray alien, and because it had all the outward hallmarks of what a gray alien looks like. It had the expanded parietals, it had the crease down the middle at the top of the head, it had the very... Uh, heart-shaped, lower, uh, very small, lower face. It had everything it, it was supposed to have to, to be a gray. So that's, they assumed that it might be that. And now, so they contacted me because I knew a little bit about skulls and I was free to, to do it. So they said, would you try to find out scientifically what it is? And I undertook that job in February of 1999, thinking that, it was, and I felt the same way they did. It was very obvious to me that it was a very unusual skull. So I undertook the job and I told them it would take maybe six months to show scientists around the world that this thing really needed and demanded uh, intense investigation to find out what it is. Well, that's how naive I was. I'm, I'm talking to you at, 11, at 10 and a half years. I'm in my 11th year with this. Yes. This is the kind of resistance that I've met. This is not an answer that science wants to deal with, but that said, I have still been able to convince a, a lot of scientists to, to help us to, to tell me things about it that I didn't know. So over those years, we've collected an enormous amount of factual information about the star child, all of which strongly indicates, makes it almost a lead pipe cinch in fact, that the star child is indeed a human-alien hybrid with a human mother and an alien father. I know what a, what a powerful and volatile statement that is, but nonetheless, that is the truth at this point. So what do you think here? Do you think that this is evidence of an experiment gone wrong, or do you think that this is simply one among many, but this is the only find that we have at this point? Well, it is the only find that we have at this point of this kind. That, that's for sure. But to say that it's an experiment gone wrong, I think, is not the case because the star child is not a misshapen being by any stretch of the imagination. It's very, very perfect, in fact. It's more symmetrical than your average human. It is absolutely perfect on both sides of, its, of itself. Its eye sockets are incredibly symmetrical. Uh, you can you can look. It has very very shallow eye sockets first. Its optic foramens and its optic nerve have been moved to a completely different location <clears throat> than what humans normally have, and yet it, it, they're both pre precisely placed in each eye socket. If you look at the surface of the bone of the eye sockets, your eyes 
absolutely cannot pick up any differences in the terrain. And yet your fingertips, which are much more sensitive, can. And you will, you will feel shifts in the terrain of both sockets, shifts that you cannot see with your eyes. But those shifts are there, and they're exactly the same in both eye sockets. So whatever this thing was, its genes were telling it to grow differently from a normal human being. And not just in the eye sockets, Henry, not, not, not at all. Yeah. What you have is every single physiological corollary that you can think of in a human. Just say anything. Ears, head, bone, rear of head, neck. Uh, it, whatever you think of, it's different in the star child. And not just a little bit different, significantly different such that there's no doubt that every single suite of genes in a human being that produce a human being to look the way it does, every one of those suites of genes in the star child are different. So it's not a human being. I mean, you couldn't produce something like the star child with so many things different, so many things, quote, wrong, and have it still function obviously as well as it did because whatever it was it lived to a ripe old age I mean to a ripe age before it died it had to be at least an adult mm. before it died so it was very functional despite being so completely different from a human being and uh, at this point the skull was the only thing found there wasn't any bones leg bone or any any other uh, no no actually no 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 the 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 two full skeletons. I mean, if, if you want me to run over the story real quick, I will. The, one, the girl, the woman, when she was a girl, she was about 15 in 1930, and she was with her parents who were of Mexican heritage, and they were visiting Mexico. And they went down to the village where the, her parents had come from. It was her first visit there. And when they arrived, the, the villagers said, don't go in the mine tunnels and the caves in this area, which was high desert country, kind of like northern Arizona, like around the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of anything comparable in Scandinavia, but you've all seen pictures of, of northern Arizona and the Grand Canyon. It was like that. Yes. So um, it, they, they said, we don't do that. We don't go there. It's dangerous. Just stay out. Well, you know, being an, a, a teenager at the time, she just snuck off as soon as she could, and she went in. She found a mine tunnel very isolated away from the village, and she went in, and she found in that mine tunnel, lying on its back, a human skeleton. And beside that skeleton was a mounded up heap of dirt, which was to her eyes clearly a grave. And then she noticed that a, a hand, a bony hand, was sticking out of the dirt, and that hand was wrapped around the upper arm bone of the human lying on its back. So because it was in a mine tunnel, there was no compaction of the earth. It was very loose and rubbly. So she, with her bare hands, dug it out, and she found another whole skeleton there, smaller than the one on, on the ground. And she called it misshapen. She said the whole thing was misshapen compared mm. to the human. Mm. So she recovered or tried to recover both full skeletons, was unable to do that. There was a, she tried, she hit them at first to try to figure out how to get them back into the States. They were washed away in a flash flood. Some damage was done to both of them. And she was able to recover, find the skulls washed downstream and, and uh, recovered those in a piece of maxilla of the, of the star child. And those are the ones she considered herself lucky to have that. And she was, she was extremely lucky to get that. And, that, and those are the things that she kept as a souvenir of that trip for her whole life. And that, that's how it came to light in early 1999 when Ray and Melanie Young contacted me to try to start finding out what it was from a scientific standpoint. Uh, and, and if we uh, go a little bit deeper into the science here, I mean, quite a few advances now has taken place in terms of DNA Uh, research and, and, and the technology of, of how we map the, the gene, genome in recent years uh, compared to when you started over uh, to almost 10 years ago now then. Uh, but maybe you can tell us what you've done so far and then we can talk a little bit about what has basically changed here in, in, the, in the last couple of years, if not even the last year here. Right, right. It's been a tremendous change. Um, in 1999, in late 1999, all of 1999, I, I found out very quickly that I wasn't going to be able to prove the case of the star child 
with physiological differences alone. Even though, as I said earlier, every single physiological comparison that you can make between the human skull and the star child skull is different. The star child is just different. A, a, a scientist said to me, and I, they kept just rejecting it, saying, it doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't matter how many of these things you stack up. And one guy said to me, I don't care if you stack up 10,000 physiological differences, Lloyd, I'm still going to be able to say to you, Mother Nature can do this because nature can do anything. Nature can create anything it wants. And so it could create this skull still using, you know, only its powers, and you can't convince me that this is different than a human being. And I said, but look, the bone itself is not even human bone. The bone is tooth enamel. How in the world can you not accept that that's not human? The bone is tooth enamel. And he said, I don't care. Nature can do that. Nature can do anything. So he said, the only thing I'll be impressed by is genetics. If you show me that it's genetically different, then I'll be impressed. Okay, well, so I, I checked in 1999, and there were only six labs in the world capable of doing, at that time, what we needed, which was ancient DNA recovery. And ancient DNA is after 50 years. Mm. All the stuff you see on CSI and all that, where it's just very easy to recover DNA, that is fresh DNA. That is from a living or a not long dead individual, and it's easy to recover and do all that. It only costs a few hundred dollars. But to do ancient DNA at that time costs many things, several thousand dollars. Yes. And so those six labs in 1999 would not do the test, just wouldn't even fool with the star child because of the embarrassment of it. So with, there was a new forensic lab in Vancouver, British Columbia that was willing to do it, but they were clear that they weren't equipped properly to do it. And they said, but if your skull was buried in a mine tunnel, maybe the degradation isn't really bad, and, and we should be able to get a result for you. They, they weren't. They, they messed up. They made a mistake, and they couldn't do it. So in 2003, four years later, there were now two dozen labs that were able to do ancient DNA, and we were able to get one that was willing to do it. And those guys, Trace Genetics, were able to give a very good analysis of the star child DNA because it was indeed very fresh. It wasn't degraded. It, they didn't have any problem recovering the mitochondrial DNA. Now, there's two kinds of DNA. There's the mitochondrial DNA that in a cell, imagine in a cell, the way you, or you know, normal typical cell in your body, you have the outer cell wall. Inside that is the cytoplasm, and floating inside the cytoplasm is the nucleus. In the nucleus, you have the entire genomic package, the chromosomes from the mother and from the father. In a human, it's 23 from mom, 23 from dad, 46 chromosome total. Floating outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm are what's called mitochondria, and they have DNA in them as well. In the nucleus, you have about 3 billion base pairs total, yes. 3 billion base pairs total. In each mitochondria, which is like a little piece of sand or like a raisin in a pudding, if you want to imagine it like that, you have about 16,000. Mitochondria, uh, base pairs, I'm sorry, 16,000 base pairs compared to 3 billion in the nucleus. So the mitochondria always comes down from the female. So when you're looking at mitochondrial DNA, you're looking at the mitochondria, I mean the base pairs of the mother, of the grandmother, of the great-grandmother, of the great-great-grandmother, of the great-great-great-great-grand, right on back. Yes. Okay? So the star child's mother grandmother, all that was human. So that tells you that the, the egg that conceived this being was from a human being. But the nucleus, which contains the DNA of both the mother and the father, when, they, when Trace Genetics tried to recover samples of that, in six full attempts, they could not. And what that meant was one of two things. You could say you could have one of two answers. The father is not a human being, or somehow, some way, the DNA is the nuclear DNA is degraded in some exotic way that nobody's ever seen before. 
but it it has to be that because it can't be that it's <laughs> you know not a human being. Well, we all knew that really dad was not a human being because the DNA was fresh. It was clear that it was fresh. The mitochondrial DNA pulled up very cleanly, very clearly on the first test. The human being found with it, her DNA pulled up both mitochondrial and nuclear, pulled up first attempt, first test, very easy, very cleanly. Mm -hmm. So we know the star child's DNA is fresh. But because it wouldn't recover with primers, we also knew that dad wasn't human, but they couldn't say that. They couldn't openly announce that because there was the possibility that it was somehow degraded in some exotic way. So what the geneticist said to me was, if, if you will wait three to five years, there will be a test that will allow you to recover the entire genome, every single base pair, and then you will be able to prove what we know here, you will be able to prove it beyond a shadow of any scientific doubt. There will be no way science can say it's not true because DNA is the equivalent of math. It's so precise, it's so exact. If you do everything right with DNA, DNA will absolutely lead you to an answer you can't dispute. And, mm. and that's the way it is in legal cases nowadays, and that's the way it'll be with the star child as well. So uh, you, you, you did hook up with a, a pair of guys from uh, 454 Life Sciences, and, and right, wh what right. they said, I guess, then as well, is that they, they don't have, if I understand this correctly, they don't have a, a they need some kind of before that is, uh, th this technology become, be became available, that they need some kind of reference in order to uh, track, pin down, rather, the, the DNA but what what they need to do now then, or what you need to do now, is to map the entire, uh, uh, the, all of the base pairs here, so to speak. And at that point, that will tell you if it indeed is a human or not, or how, how can we uh, know what it is at that point, so to speak? Will we have a reference, or do we need a reference? No, we don't need a reference. We did, we did need a reference in 203 with the, um, with the primers. But there was no there was no reference because there was no you know obviously no alien to compare it against the star child is going to establish the reference it will be the reference but there was nothing we could do in 203 but again they said in three to five years there will be a test come online because we know they're working on it that will allow this to happen well sure enough three years later to the month we were talking to them in July of 203 in July of 206. 454 Life Sciences in Brantford, Connecticut announced that they had indeed perfected the technique of recovery of a genome on a base pair by base pair basis. And so we now, but, but at that time in 206, it cost millions of dollars and took two to three years because the, the, they only had just one or two machines that could do it. Now they've built many machines that are out there in, in labs all over the world now. It's kind of like the situation was in 1999. There were six labs that can do it. In, in 2003, there were um, two dozen that could do it. It's the same sort of thing now. In 2006, there was only one or two machines <laughs> available, and all of those were, everything was being put toward recovering the Neanderthal genome, and they're still working on the Neanderthal genome, by the way. Yes. But it should be finished by the end of this year. But now they are able, 454 could take the star child today and start and have an answer in three to four months. Hmm. Now, that would cost about $200,000, but that's so much cheaper than the millions that it was before. It's a bargain. It's a really a deal. Yes. And you and I both know there are people that go to casinos on weekends and blow that much money in on a bad weekend. <laughs> it, so the, it's it's... It's easy enough now for us to find the deep pockets, but one of the reasons I'm, I'm you know, doing interviews and, and, and getting on Facebook and going to develop a blog and do, is to start letting more people know so they can buy the ebook, get the ebook, acquire the ebook, however, and, and inform themselves so they can, the word will spread and eventually it's going to fall into the hands of somebody with deep pockets who wants to know have the answer and they'll get in touch with me and we'll be on our way so that that's where it stands but now to answer the question about what 
what will 454 give us for that money? Yes, they'll give us the base pairs of the star child, even though at this point they're completely unknown, to compare against the human, which is known, the, the human genome, which is known, the, the chimp genome, which is known, the gorilla genome, which is known, and soon the Neanderthal genome. So we'll be able to compare the star child to all of those, base pair by base pair. And what what we'll be looking for is the percentage difference between the star child and a normal human being. Mm. Now, what that means is this, that the chimp is about 3% different from a human being. 97% the same, 3% different. And that's about, oh, 90 million base pairs, 90 million. A, a gorilla is about 5% different. 95 the same, 5% different, about 150 million base pairs different, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the question then is, where does the Neanderthal fit? Well, everybody assumes it's going to be between the chimp and the human, somewhere in there, but nobody knows where it's going to fall. Is it going to fall closer to the chimp, closer to the gorilla? That's what they want to know. And just as a sidelight, they're all hoping that it'll be closer to the human. I say it's going to be closer to the chimp. Hmm. We'll see. I, I see. say that Neanderthals are, are hominoid types. But anyway, with the star child, I believe, based on what I know, based on 10 years of research and looking at all the, the facts as, as passionately as I can, I think that the star child is going to be the chimp or the gorilla or more. Because, again, if you just look at the skull, every single aspect is different. Now, the skull of a chimp and the skull of a gorilla is very different as well. But, you know, within their bodies, within their, their organs and their, you know, there's a lot of similarity. You can do a lot of scientific testing on a chimp and it, and it sort of responds a lot like the way a human would. I think the star child probably is very different physiologically through its whole body. And I think that it, at a minimum, there will be no doubt that it's not a human being. Even if it goes out to half a percent away from human, you know, like it's 99.5, that'll be close enough to make the argument that it's not human. Because humans fall within a very narrow band, about 99.99. I mean, we're all very much alike, human yes. beings, yeah. despite how different we look. So the star child doesn't have to fall far to be considered not human. So if we got out to 1%, that's not human. 2%. I mean, it's not even arguable that it's human. 3%. It's the equivalent of a chimp. Who could argue that? Yeah. I think that it's going to be out in the 3 to 5 range or beyond because it's just so different, so incredibly different. Every single suite of genes in its skull for sure is different, and that's going to be enough right there. But if you extrapolate that down through the body, and remember that the girl said when she, when she saw the skeleton, that it had a misshapen body, that its whole body, the skeleton of it, didn't look the same. I think that's going to be true, and I think that the star child, for whatever it was, it was mostly, mostly alien. Mostly its father's genes dominated. Hmm. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that in another answer, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to ask something now. Yeah, well, what I'm thinking about here, just to reiterate kind of the goal right now for you in that sense, it is to afford a test, obviously, on this and, and to map uh, the, the full genome here. And we're talking about around $200,000, something like that. And there is obviously a, a lot of money, but the implications of this is is huge. But I want to ask you if you suspect that the technology, uh, even even in one year from now, will, will this enable uh, these tests to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper down the road, do you think? I think they will get progressively cheaper, but they can't go past a certain point, I don't think, of cheapness. They're, they're, because it's just the work is so extensive, we're talking about 3 billion units of data, 3 billion units of data that have to be acquired. That's going to be time consuming and, and you know, there just comes a certain point. Let's say it gets down to $100,000. Okay, fine. You know, we, we can go as long as we need to, but it's payable right now, really. The, the cost of it is payable right now. And I should also add that there's a two, two parts to this process. Well, three parts, really. There is the actual acquisition of the data, 
which is what 454 technology, what the machines do. They just acquire the data. Then the data has to be read or interpreted by experts, by specialists who do this. And that's another probably 50,000 right there. So to get them to compare the star child to a human, to a chimp, to a gorilla, to a Neanderthal, that's going to be an expensive and expensive process as well. So we're looking at more like a quarter million to do that part of the job. But at the same time, we have to be able to film the process as it's unfolding. Mm -hmm. We have to be doing a, creating a documentary because if we do not film every single step, every single important significant step along the way, then you know and I know that the first answer that science will give is, oh, well, you've made some kind of mistake. Do it over. We don't believe your result. Do it over. Yeah. We don't accept it. So it has to be filmed. Everything from the cutting of the bone to the eureka moment, when you have the result, has to be filmed. And that's going to be when you do that and you film the backstory and put together a documentary to pay for the process. You know, that's another 250 to 300,000 or, or more process there. But it isn't like we're asking somebody to give us a gift of the money. It's an investment. You're, you, whoever puts up the money is putting up the money for the documentary, and they're going to own a piece of the most important film in the world for a few years at least, for at least two or three years until people get you know, used to the idea that this is the new reality. So um, it's a good investment. It's not, you know, sooner or later, somebody with real money is going to understand this is, this is a good investment. It really is. So it's going to happen, and I think it's going to kick off within maybe by the end of this year we'll find that person because I'm going to push from here to the end of this year as hard as I can to get people to, to get the ebook, make themselves familiar with the facts, understand how overwhelming the facts are, and pass it on to their friends and, and colleagues and associates or whatever because that's the only way I think we can get it into the hands of the right kind of person because when, when we try, when I try to contact uh, famous people with serious money like Steven Spielberg or Dan Aykroyd or Oprah Winfrey or any of those people who might be willing to do something like this, mm. they are surrounded by people whose job it is to prevent people like me from getting in touch with them. You know? <laughs> right, right. So it's going to have to go, it's going to have to go in through a friend of a friend of a friend where they'll actually, it'll actually get put in their hands. And that's really the only way I can see to go about it. Mm. But, but you, do you think that you're at this point, you're looking for someone as a, a, a private donor, so to speak, or do you think that it's possible that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's no, there's no official, organization that I'm aware of that would put up the money for something like this. It will almost have to be a private individual or uh, some small group of individuals who want to put it up and, and get an answer. There will be, there are a lot of people out there right now that want the answer and yes. aren't afraid of the answer yes. but don't have the means to finance it. Eventually though, you, there are a lot of millionaire, multimillionaires and billionaires out there it, a lot. We around the world, different countries. We just have to cross the path of the right one at the right time in the right way, and and then we'll be off to the races. It will happen. Well, that is very very interesting. And, and uh, in that regard, can also people at this point already, let's say they get a copy of your ebook, will that help to support this uh, cause as well, uh, Lloyd? Absolutely. I, the The whole point is support the cause by getting the ebook, and that. That helps me to do the things that I have to do, to spend the money that I have to spend. I mean, it isn't like I'm asking for money. It isn't like I'm begging for money. I'm giving good value to anybody who gets that book. You've read it. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. That is a book that's well worth uh, the little bit of money that it costs. I mean, you can get that book for what it'll take you to go out to get uh, to go to a, a movie or have dinner. I mean, it, it's it's so important that everybody that can get it, become aware of how much things have changed. Because let's, let's be honest, for a long time, for many years here, there was, you know, critics could say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. There's no way to prove. There's no way to prove. There's no way to prove. And it was true. There was. I, I had no way to prove. But now I do have a way to prove. And because I do have a way to prove, 
they're starting to take me a lot more seriously now and they're actually starting to work against me. And this is something that we can talk about later, um, you know from the notes that I sent you. But yeah, now they're, everybody on the other side is aware. They didn't have to worry about me too much before because I had no way to prove this. Now I do. And so now they're having to begin to work against me a little bit behind the scenes. Yes. And that's beginning to happen, and I'll share that with, them, with the audience uh, soon. And uh, if we talk a little bit about some of the implications of this, what it means uh, to you and what you think it, it will mean to, well, science overall, but also the, the whole question of human origins, do you think that this will uh, greatly add to the debate? Will we have a, a, an official new theory here, so to speak, or will it prove that, that's, that something else has been going on here in human history? I, I believe that's absolutely the core of what's going to happen. I really do. I, I myself have been sort of at the leading edge of, of uh, the intervention theory of human origins before I knew about the star child. I wrote a book, uh, as, you, as you know, I'm sure, Everything You Know Is Wrong, uh, which, by the way, I just put back into print for anybody that's interested in getting a copy of it at uh, iUniverse.com, www, the letter I and universe.com. But Everything You Know Is Wrong, in which I outlined all the details of why I believed and I, why I think the facts back up um, the theory that humans did not evolve on planet Earth, that we were genetically engineered and put here for a specific purpose by specific individuals. But even if those, you know, if, if we're wrong about the purpose in the individuals, it doesn't matter. We were put here. We're a genetically engineered species. Our genes make that clear. A number of th other things make that clear. We are not native to this planet. And that, and that was all outlined in my book, Everything You Know Is Wrong. And in fact, that book is why Ray and Melanie contacted me because I had done so much uh, research with skulls and you know, with the human anatomy and all that. So I believe that the star child, just coincidentally, it, it fell into my hands and I'm able to make, I think, very cogent arguments for the fact that when the star child is established as what it is, which is a human-alien hybrid, it's going to be a very small step to look at human beings and say, we are in fact alien-human hybrids of a different kind, not, not like the star child. But what was done to us was also done to it. I do not think that the star child is the product of a sexual union. I don't think that's possible. I do believe very thoroughly, very completely, that genetically you can engineer a being like the star child and you can engineer a being like us if you know what you're doing. We were created a couple of hundred thousand years ago. The star child was created somewhat before the time of 900 years ago. So whoever did us had the capacity to do it, or beings like it. And I think when you look at the genetics and you look at what we're doing right now today in genetics, we are doing close to, not exactly, but close to the equivalent of what was done to create the star child and to create us. We're on the track. We're on the trail that's going to lead us to have the same capacity to do what was done to create us and what was done to create the star child. It's just a matter of time. Um, before here, Lloyd, you mentioned a little bit about uh, tooth enamel as well as, as the kind of, um, uh, as a stronger form of material compared to the, the, the regular human skull. Maybe for, for those who are interested in the process and how uh, you've taken material, so to speak, that has been analyzed, uh, uh, I guess that you, you've taken a piece out of the skull here uh, and and uh, uh, compared its uh, density and its uh, co composition and so forth. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Well, you can see the chart that's in the ebook. Uh, you you see the graph of the two. You you do it with a scanning electron microscope, and basically it tells you the biochemical uh, makeup of the bone, the chemistry of the bone. And human bone has a certain look to it, a certain graph, a certain chart, and it and it just looks the same. The percentages, the ratios of the, of the chemicals in the bone 
or, or a certain amount. In the star child, the ratios are very different of some of the, of some of the chemicals, and that difference is what you see when you uh, do a scanning electron microscope of tooth enamel. So while the bone, the star child bone, is not exactly tooth enamel, because you know that's that's you know white and shiny and hard hard hard. There are very dominant elements of tooth enamel in the bone of the star child, even though it is bone. It's much harder, much harder. You should see the difference, as I have with my own eyes, in how much harder it is to cut through the star child than it is to cut through normal human bone. And remember, normal human bone is twice as thick as the star child twice as thick, hmm. and yet it is much easier to cut through than that little thin piece of the star child bone. What, I mean, it just looks so weird to, to see it done and, and watch the level of strain someone has to generate to cut through human bone, and then watch that level of strain, of strain accelerate as you try to cut through the star child bone. It's really amazing. Yeah. But, not a, but, but let's say this, it's not just... I have to say this, it's not just the, the strength of the actual bone material that makes it hard to cut through. Buried into the matrix of the star child bone, understand this, buried in the matrix of the bone is, are these fibers in a kind of a net of some kind that add to the strength of the bone itself. And these fibers are not found in any other bone on Earth that anybody knows about. Hmm. No other bone at all has these kinds of fibers. The star child is absolutely unique in that regard. How it is it in regards to, to age, then? You mentioned something around, you, you speculate around eight or 900 uh, years ago. How was that determined? Well, carbon-14, very simple. Both skulls were tested with carbon-14 dating in different labs at different times, and both results came back exactly, exactly 900 years ago, plus or minus 40 years. Now, even the people that do this for a living say they almost never see two samples come in exactly the same when you do them in different labs, and you know, because it just, it just you know, little errors are going to creep in, but both of the results were exactly the same at different labs. So there can be little doubt that they both died together, just as the girl said she found them, at the same time about 900 years ago, about 1100 uh, AD. There you go. And, uh, um, you, you know, there, there are so many different things that I want to get into. I, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of what you fee, uh, feel in regards to uh, the implications, I want to ask even about the location, the fact that uh, the, in, in Mesoamerica, around Mexico area, has a lot of uh, mythology and so forth. And this is something I want to get into a little bit later on. But do you think that there are some points here that we should touch upon that we might have neglected so we can mention here in the first hour, Lloyd? Well, just that I, I would like to say that um, if, if anybody will continue on into the second hour, we're going to be talking about the shift, I think, that's gone on with the other side. I think that I, I was let, people on the other side let me go for, people always say to me, well, does, why doesn't the government try to stop you? Why doesn't anybody try to stop you? Why do they just let you go? Because when I started out in 1999, there wasn't a glimmer on the horizon of a way for me to actually prove this thing was an alien or an alien-human hybrid. Now, you know, seven years after that, eight years after that, there is, a, there is a way for me to do it. And so now they're mobilizing against me, but it, it's too late. They, they can't stop me, really. It, the, the horse is way out of the barn. So now all they can do really is slow me down. And they're doing that. They are slowing me down by working against me. And I'll, I'll be talking about the things that they've done, I think, in the last year to work to, to do that. And, and we, you know, we can take it from there. But otherwise, I think it's been a good discussion up to this point. I hope, uh, I hope you're satisfied, and I hope the listeners are, uh, that they have a, a better understanding of how incredibly important the star child is and has become now that we have the ability to prove what I've been saying for years, that it really, truly is an alien-human hybrid, and we're going to be able to prove it. And how is it in, in terms of uh, talks and so forth? Are you still looking for 
traveling to other places around the world to get the word out in that way. And hopefully you'll, uh, as, as we talked about here, stumble over someone who has the interest and the f- finances to help and support you in this case. What I really need, and more than me physically flying all over the world, and, I, and remember, I, I did do that earlier this year, and I had some success, but, but not enough. I really need to mobilize an army out there of people like you and like others who can speak for me, who can work for me on, on this, who can join the team and get the, get the e-book, and if possible, of course, get the other book as well. But the e-book is, is powerful enough in and of itself, and it isn't. It's about an hour to read for anybody. Anybody can read that book in an hour. It's everything as tightly it, that's important as tightly packed as I can pack it. And it isn't asking anybody too much to read that book and to, to um, take it to whoever they know that might be useful. And when they, you know, that that might be interested in it, it might be useful to the cause. And if I can get enough foot soldiers out there in the battle, recruited into the battle, and, and make myself a little army out there, the right person will eventually be contacted, and that person will then contact me, and we'll be off. I don't know any other way to do it. If you can think of a better way, that <laughs> I want to hear it. But given everything that I've done, and, and the fact that it's just so difficult to get through to celebrities from me because people, you know, they just, they have their job and their job is to keep people like me away from people like that. Friend of a friend of a friend, you know, it's the old six degrees of separation thing. If I can just recruit enough people who are aware of this, who understand it and who can talk about it intelligently to their friends and their colleagues, if that can be passed along, eventually it goes to the right person and we're in business. And you've done various uh, kind of uh, short little uh uh, appearances on various uh, TV shows, morning shows here and there. Has that yielded anything? Do you, right. do, you, do, you, do you see that going on? Mainstream media is helping you in this cause as well. No, you know, they, they do, they try, but you know what the problem is really? The problem that, that I run up against regularly with all of them and with everybody else really is this. They say to themselves and they say out loud, well, wait a minute. If this was true, if this was really true, Lloyd, if you were really right about this, wouldn't I know about it already? Mm. Wouldn't it already be known? And that I hear that again and again and again. Well, if, it, if something this important was true, was really true, I would know about it already because the media would have let me know, because science would have let me know. But the truth of it is, this is a, an answer, this is a subject that science doesn't want to deal with, that the media doesn't really want to deal with. Nobody wants a bomb of this size to explode on their watch. Nobody in charge wants, wants an upheaval of the level that this is going to cause to happen on their watch. So there is resistance to letting it happen any faster than it has to. I think by the same token that government and everybody else realizes that there's no way to stop this now. There's no way to avoid it. Uh, we've got pieces of the skull scattered out. They can't capture it. They can't, they can't bottle it up. The genie's out of the bottle, and it's just a matter of time. They know it. I know it. They could take me out. What's the point? It doesn't matter. There are other people out there that know where the pieces and parts are. They'd have, they'd have to take out. They'd have to literally kill a dozen, 25 people to, to really stop. They can't do it. Everybody would know. It would be a very ugly thing, and I think they know it. So I think I'm inoculated against being stopped but I'm not inoculated against being slowed down. I am being slowed down. Mm. Now, I'm trying to fight that slowdown, and, I, and that's what I'm doing by being on your show and, and talking to your listeners, and I'm going to be on as, you know, other shows, and I'm going to write articles, and I'm going to do everything I can to get the word out. And we will, we will reach that tipping point. And when we reach that tipping point, the momentum is going to go our way, and we'll, we'll be in the catbird seat, and things will will unfold as you know as we know they will. Sounds really good. And and again, what I really like about the new ebook ebook is what you mentioned a little bit here. It's very it's condensed. It's uh, point by point, very very simple and powerfully laid out uh, to uh, what has been found out about the skull today. And uh, Lloyd, tell us here uh, as we begin to round things up for the first hour, 
uh, where we can go to get a copy and uh, help you along in your work and research, Lloyd? Okay, all you have to do is go to the Starchild website, www.starchildproject. That is all one word, starchildproject.com. And when you go to that to the to the home page there, if you scroll down at the just a little bit, scroll down toward the bottom, you'll see check the new ebook and and check here for a free uh, reading sample. And it just has a few pages, so you can kind of see how it's laid out and you know get a feel for it. And then you uh, you just click on and you order it. I have to say this though, and we say it on the the page the the page that you go to look at it. It's only good for PCs. Macs do not work. Because when you encrypt an ebook like this, uh, Macs don't allow that kind of, they, they don't work with it. So if you have a Mac, use a PC. That's all I can tell you. Uh, we would like it to be otherwise. But there are a lot of ebook pirates out there, and you just have to work against them as best you can. So if you've got a PC, you're in good shape, easy enough to get and download and read. Um, but if you've got a Mac, it's not going to work. Okay, again, the website is storechildproject.com, but also check out some of the other uh, books that is by Lloyd Pye uh, by going to the website iuniverse.com or simply lloydpye.com for much more. Well, I should, I should say this. I should make it clear. It's kind of confusing, but the ebook the ebook you can only get from my website, the Star Child Project website. The Star Child Skull book, the, 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 the full book about the Star Child, it's called The Star Child Skull. That you have to go to Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk. It only is available through Amazon. My book, Everything You Know is Wrong, which is about my human origins and my intervention theory work, that you can only get through iUniverse. Well, no, you sorry, you can get it through Amazon too, but I'm not sure that they're, they're, uh, they, they have the, the cheap version posted on uh, Amazon at this time. So go to iUniverse, www.i, the letter I in the word universe, .com, and you can get everything you know is wrong if you're interested in that. But really, I, I want everybody who can to get the ebook. It's right now. It's important that we get the word out about the Star Child, and the best way to do it is through the ebook, because as you say, it is the it is the highlights, it is the best parts of it, put together in a very tight package, just ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, fact after fact, as tight as I could do it, and it's easy to absorb, it's clear, it's easy to understand. And you walk away from that knowing, I mean, anybody, even a skeptic, walks away from that experience knowing the star child is not a, a deformity, not a human deformity. It is something else, and it is what I, I tell you it is. It is a human-alien hybrid. It's great to be here. It really is. A, you're one of my favorite shows, and I always enjoy being on with you guys. Excellent. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, you know, why don't we do like this for potential new listeners, for those who might be new to this subject, have never heard about the Star Child skull. Give us a quick rundown uh, of, of this uh, issue, Lloyd, and how you got into this. Okay. Well, it, the Star Child skull is a real, true bone skull. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it was found in Mexico in about 1930 by a woman who thought it was just a, a misshapen human of some kind, a birth defect, a deformity, and she kept it and another skull that she found in a mine tunnel for the duration of her life from about 1930 to the early 90s. And when she found out that she was dying, she passed them on to some friends of hers. They kept them for about five years and passed them on to some friends of theirs. This all occurred in El Paso, Texas in the States, although she found the skulls in Mexico about 100 miles southeast of Chihuahua. So when the skulls came into the possession of Ray and Melanie Young, Melanie had been a neonatal nurse for a number of years, and she knew an awful lot about human deformity. It was, and I felt the same way they did. It was very obvious to me that it was a very unusual skull. So I undertook the job, and I told them it would take maybe six months to show scientists around the world that this thing really needed and demanded uh, intense investigation to find out what it is. Well, that's how naive I was. I'm, I'm talking to you at, 11, at 10 and a half years. I'm in my 11th year with this. Yes. This is the kind of resistance 
that I've met. Pete, this is not an answer that science wants to deal with, but that said, I have still been able to convince a, a lot of scientists to, to help us to, to tell me things about it that I didn't know. So over those years, we've collected an enormous amount of factual information about the star child, all of which strongly indicates, makes it almost a lead pipe cinch, in fact, that the star child is indeed a human alien hybrid with a human mother and an alien father. I know what a, what a powerful and volatile statement that is, but nonetheless, that is the truth at this point. So what do you think here? Do you think that this is evidence of an experiment gone wrong, or do you think that this is simply one among many, but this is the only find that we... ...from a normal human being, and not just in the eye sockets, Henrik, not, not, not at all. Yeah. What you have is every single physiological corollary that you can think of in a human, just say anything, ears, head, bone, rear of head, neck, uh, it, whatever you think of, it's different in the star child, and not just a little bit different, significantly different, such that there's no doubt that every single suite of genes in a human being that produce a human being to look the way it does, every one of those suites of genes in the star child are different. Mm -hmm. So it's not a human being. I mean, you couldn't produce something like the star child with so many things different so many things, quote, wrong, and have it still function, obviously, as well as it did, because whatever it was, it lived to a ripe old age, I mean, to a ripe age before it died. It had to be at least an adult mm. before it died. So it was very functional, despite being so completely different from a human being. And uh, at this point, the skull was the only thing found. There wasn't any bones, leg bone, or any, any other... Uh, uh, no, no, actually, no, no, no. The, 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 and right away, she knew this was very different than your typical standard human deformity. It was entirely too light, it was entirely too symmetrical, and its physical properties were so different from a normal human, she right away suspected that it wasn't entirely human. More importantly, she and her husband, Ray, were members of MUFON in El Paso, which is the Mutual UFO Network. In other words, they were interested in UFO things. And so they could both see that the star child's skull looked as if it would fit perfectly inside the head of a gray alien. And because it had all the outward hallmarks of what a gray alien looks like. It had the expanded parietals. It had the crease down the middle at the top of the head. It had the very... Uh, heart-shaped, lower, uh, very small, lower face. It had everything it, it was supposed to have to, to be a gray. So that's, they assumed that it might be that. And now, so they contacted me because I knew a little bit about skulls and I was free to, to do it. So they said, would you try to find out scientifically what it is? And I undertook that job in February of 1999 thinking that we have at this point well it is the only find that we have at this point of this kind that that's for sure but to say that it's an experiment gone wrong i think is not the case because the star child is not a misshapen being by any stretch of the imagination it's very very perfect in fact it's more symmetrical than your average human. It is absolutely perfect on both sides of, its, of itself. Its eye sockets are incredibly symmetrical. Uh, you, can, you can look, it has very, very shallow eye sockets first. Its optic foramens and its optic nerve have been moved to a completely different location <clears throat> than what humans normally have, and yet it, it, they're both pre precisely placed in each eye socket. If you look at the surface of the bone of the eye sockets, your eyes absolutely cannot pick up any differences in the terrain. And yet your fingertips, which are much more sensitive, can. And you will, you will feel shifts in the terrain of both sockets, shifts that you cannot see with your eyes. But those shifts are there, and they're exactly the same in both eye sockets. So whatever this thing was, its genes were telling it to grow differently.